Hello everyone, I'm George Taylor from Imagine Earning, and on this episode, a brief history of amusement parks. Mention the phrases theme park or amusement park, and thoughts will generally drift towards Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom, or a regional park like Six Flags, Cedar Point, or Kings Island. The story of amusement parks, though, reflects the general history of humanity through culture, technology, economics, and even race. Let's take a look at the rich tapestry of amusement parks. During the golden age of amusement parks, the 1920s, there were more than 2,000 parks and roller coasters across the United States. The Great Depression, World War II, and disasters, mostly man-made, would spell the end of many parks across the country. It wasn't until the birth of Disneyland in 1955 and the rebirth of the roller coaster at Kings Island, Cincinnati, Ohio, in 1972, that amusement parks would become popular again. World War I, the Depression, and disasters would spell the end of many parks across the country, as would changing times and transportation. During Disneyland and the baby boom, kiddie parks would be in major cities, and western theme parks would appear like tumbleweeds. Parks and amusements near coastlines would be a staple for residents and visitors and would take many forms. The next item on the agenda is to briefly cover the evolution of amusement parks. This video isn't the place for a detailed analysis of amusement park history, but it is necessary to offer a rudimentary take on how we arrived at places like Disneyland, Universal Parks, and Busch Gardens. More specifically, since I've fielded inquiries in which people assumed that Coney Island was the very first amusement park in the world, explanations are in order. Amusement parks didn't just appear, but like most societal and cultural organizations, evolved over time. It's hard to pinpoint when the idea of an amusement park truly came into focus. By looking at community antecedents, we can create an educated timeline. This pulls in religious, political, and economic concerns to lay the groundwork. In short order, a theme park can be considered an amusement park, but an amusement park can't be considered a theme park. For the most part, an amusement park is an enclosed or gated area with rides or attractions. A theme park is an amusement park that is highly themed to an idea or a time period. Most of us would think of the Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World as a theme park, which would be correct. It's a gated park with various themed areas where the outside world does not intrude. A park like Cedar Point is more of an amusement park even though it does have themed areas. For most of this video, I will simply use the term amusement park. The earliest mentions of a fair of any type can be traced to the religious festivals of England. St. Bartholomew's in London is recorded as starting in 1102. At that time, small towns would be granted a charter to hold a religious festival based on a saint. Tradesmen traveled, usually in groups to be safe from thieves and brigands, and chartered fairs offered a gathering place. The churches profited by attracting people, exacting tolls, and rental fees. It was estimated that more than 3,300 fairs were held in the 13th century, and 1,560 fairs were held in the 14th century. Sturbridge Fair lasted more than six centuries and ended in 1855, just four years after Prince Albert's Crystal Palace opened and helped ushered in worldwide expositions. As cities and transportation grew, fairs became less important. Amusements would become more popular at the religious fairs through the centuries. In 1667, Samuel Pepys wrote that the fair had become less of a business and more of an amusement center. At Aldgate, I took my wife into our coach and so to Bartholomew Fair, and there, it being very dirty, and now night, we saw a poor fellow, whose legs were tied behind his back, dance upon his hands with his arse above his head, and also dance upon his crutches, without any legs upon the ground, to help him which he did with that pain that I was very sorry to see it, and did pity him and give him money after he had done. Then we to see a piece of clockwork made by an Englishman, indeed very good, wherein all the several states of man's age to 100 years old is shewn very pretty and solemn, and several other things more cheerful, and so we ended. From the Samuel Pepys Diaries, dated September 6, 1667. Pepys described visiting Bartholomew Fair in September of 1668 and seeing a mare that tells money. 
Pepys also ate a pig and saw a play with puppets. Sideshows, jugglers, rope dancing, spectacles, and theater productions would become the popular amusements of the times. A few fairs would last until the 19th century as popularity waned and other amusements prevailed. The oldest amusement park in the world is Bakken, located in Denmark. It opened in 1583 with the discovery of a natural spring. Crowds followed, as did entertainers and hawkers. Many of the earliest amusement parks in Europe would have their starts in pleasure gardens, which were often royal gardens that were open to the public. Bakken was part of the royal hunting grounds from 1669 to 1756, and people were not allowed to enter. When it reopened, the area flourished with the return of entertainers and the like. Pleasure gardens found their heyday in the 18th century and offered zoos, concert halls, and some rides almost exclusively powered by animals or people at the time. Vauxhall Gardens was one of the more popular pleasure gardens. It operated in London from 1660 to 1859. Most of the early entertainment was simply the gardens, fountains, and musical entertainment. Through the years, massive parties, musical celebrations, and firework displays would add to the gardens. Tivoli Gardens, a major influence on Walt Disney, started as a pleasure garden in 1843. Expositions, being notable for the development of the World's Fair and Midways, were first seen in Rome as simple exchanges of ideas. The French industrial expositions began in 1798. There would be a series of 11 total that would showcase improvements in agriculture and technology. The 1851 Great Expedition in London opened its doors to the outside world and is considered the first World's Fair. It was held in the famed Crystal Palace in London and featured over 13,000 exhibits. In 1876, the first fair held in the United States was the Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. The Philadelphia Exposition would still purport to be about advances in civilization and culture, while a shanty town popped up near the fair that provided amusements of gypsies, games of chance, beer gardens, and more. The shanty town, which was also called Dinky Town and Centennial City, demonstrated to fair planners that people would gladly pay for entertainments. On a side note, there was a miniature train that traveled around the grounds and carried visitors 8 miles per hour. It could be considered the granddaddy of all amusement park trains. The Columbian Exposition of 1893 in Chicago was the first midway to be offered in the United States, and really the first of its kind. The Midway Plaisance would become the model for every fair and carnival since. The original intent of the planners was to create an area that would educate visitors by providing villages that would show off other cultures and keep the tawdry amusements away from the white city of the fair proper. This included a Turkish village, Cairo Street, Japanese Bazaar, Java Village, Irish Village, German Village, East India Bazaar, Chinese Theater, Austrian Village, and many more. Of course, most people visited the Midway to ride on George Ferris's wheel and discover other entertainments. This was predated by the 1889 Paris Exhibition, which did move the villages and concessions to the far edges of the fair. And many of the attractions featured at the Midway Plaisance would go to fuel the growth of amusement parks across the United States. State fairs, whether they were industrial or agricultural, would offer smaller carnival areas that would mostly be for gambling and freak shows. The popularity of the carnival areas would grow after the Civil War, except when the management specifically banned them. And it wouldn't be until the late 1880s and 1890s that traveling companies would provide powered amusements to fairs. Around the turn of the 20th century, electric companies began to develop local streetcar lines as an additional way to charge riders and produce electricity for the lines. Most streetcar companies found that the cars would be devoid of travelers in the evening and on weekends. Many electric companies would purchase or lease property near the end of a specific line and add amusements and recreation facilities. Many parks like Kennywood in Pittsburgh started off as trolley parks or picnic grounds. Some evolved into full-blooded amusement parks, while many simply didn't survive the growth of automobiles. 
The trolley parks would be centered around picnic groves, bathing facilities, usually a lake, and electrically powered amusements, like a merry-go-round. They would often be referred to as electric parks due to the large number of lights installed and to pay homage to the wizardry of electricity. Many cities and communities created parks that also featured play areas, picnic spots, recreation, and amusement devices. Many parks like this that still exist today. In a few cases, there were separate facilities for whites and blacks in different parts of the cities. Prior to 1894, most amusement areas like Coney Island were simply destinations that offered bathhouses, picnic areas, merry-go-rounds, and an occasional switchback railroad and sideshows. Often a picnic area would be the center attraction with amusements branching out. Cedar Point, the Coney Island outside of Cincinnati, and Lake Compounds would all start as picnic groves and swimming areas that would add mechanical entertainments, dance halls, boat rides, restaurants, and more. Most of the individual rides and concessions were operated by individuals and not by the owners of the property. It wasn't until Paul Boyton, a world-famous aquatic daredevil, opened Paul Boyton's Water Chutes in Chicago in 1894 that we would see an enclosed amusement area with an entrance fee. The Chutes Park would offer water chutes, coasters, giant swing, and merry-go-rounds, and it would remain open until 1907. It's surmised that Boyton got the idea for an enclosed amusement park from the experiences that he had with the P.T. Barnum Circus in 1887. Boyton would open Sea Lion Park in Coney Island in 1895 on a 22-acre site that had a high fence and a single entrance. He debuted the Flip Flap Railway, which was the first looping coaster in North America. After Paul Boyton moved on from Sea Lion Park, many other people opened up parks on the Coney Island area, such as Steeplechase Park and Luna Park. Unfortunately, they would all suffer disasters, some man-made, some natural, and these would help fuel the idea of what an amusement park would be over the next 50 years. Disneyland opened in 1955, and businesses everywhere rushed to capitalize on the theme park boom. Throughout America, you would see the development of kiddie parks, usually just six to ten carnival rides, on very small plots of land. The growth of these parks in the 1950s and 1960s matched the craze in the country that was part of the baby boom. Many of these parks simply couldn't adjust to changing demographics, societal changes, or the 1970s energy crisis. Also, kids were more interested in Star Wars and outer space than the outdated parks featuring Wild West shows. Of course, there are other parks that purported to be the first theme park, like Knott's Berry Farm and Holiday World, but the term theme park wasn't coined until Disneyland opened. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, there was a boom of regional amusement parks that tried to capitalize on the success of Disneyland. The Six Flags chains would debut in 1961 in Texas, with the second park opening near Atlanta in 1967. Kings Island, the park born of Coney Island near Cincinnati, opened in 1971 and helped usher in the roller coaster races of the 70s and 80s that started with The Racer. Thank you so much for checking out this video featuring a brief history of amusement in theme parks. And I know there's a lot I've skipped and a lot I still need to cover, but we'll save that for future videos. What do you think about the history of amusement parks? Did anything surprise you? Did I leave anything out that you think is important? Leave me a comment and let me know. I would love to hear from you. I'm George Taylor from Imagine Nerding, and I hope to see you in the parks.